partner of biology at Emory University and also an adjunct professor at the at Georgia Tech, uh, where he's in the biomedical engineering department. He's also co-directing the Simons Emory Consortium on, on motor control. So um, as you will see from his talk, uh, Gordon is, is a physicist and he's brought his background in physics to the study of behavior. And he and, and, and some of his colleagues have really brought about a new quantitative approach to behavior that tries to first characterize behavior using statistical methods and then link them to ideas and principles from physics on how to study and make sense of the resulting dynamics. Um, so um, I will let Gordon speak about uh, his own research of himself and very much looking forward uh, to his talk. Um, I should also say for those of you listening, if you have questions during the talk or after the talk, please put them into the chat. And then um, I will ask. Uh, I will ask these questions on your behalf after the talk. Or, uh, um, but Gordon has also threatened that he might be looking at the chat and answer questions right away. So if you have clarifying questions during the talk, then Gordon might answer them right away. But um, at, at at latest, I will then make sure these questions get addressed at the very end. Gordon, without further ado, um, the the stage or the Zoom or whatever is is all yours. Thank you. Thanks for joining. <laughs> Thanks, Jakob. Hold on. Let me share my screen here. All right. Everybody see the uh, the screen? <laughs> all right. So let me move, get all the various things in the right places. All right. All right, so thank you very much to Yaka Benzoka for, for the invitation and for being able to chat about some of the work you've been doing over the past few years, thinking about quantitative behavior. Um, and just to, just again, to mention what Jakob just said, if you have any questions or whatnot, just please feel free to put a note into the chat and I will, I'm trying to have the, the chat up over here. So I'll try and take a look in the midst, uh, partially due to my physicist upbringing, I like being interrupted during talks. So uh, we can, I'm happy to sort of go off on various different tangents on this. So uh, great. So we'll, Let's begin. So um, in general, and sort of the stuff that we think about in the group involves these guys, animals, to a sort of writ large. And really what a lot of what we're trying to do is treat animal behavior, not as sort of the output or sort of our measurement readout of a neural system, but actually trying to think about behavior itself as the thing which is the utmost expression of all of those underlying molecular and neural dynamics that we've so, spent so much time characterizing and learning about over the past few decades. And really trying to take these types of images, whether they're from dogs running around in the wild to prairie voles desperately trying to seek their partner in a lab or a fly running around in a dish or fish in the wild or this wolverine running through uh, various habitats, trying to actually treat them in a quantitative manner and trying to think about what sort of numbers can we put on these types of videos or these types of behaviors to then get insight from what they're doing here down towards these other sort of levels, thinking about nervous systems and genetics and evolution, other things. And I'm gonna tell you about a few different examples today, uh, but uh, in general, uh, and I apologize in advance, my cat is trying to jump up on me at the moment. So there'll be some extra extra fun animal behavior that might occur in a minute. Um, so, so what sort of numbers are we talking about? So one set of numbers we can put on animal behavior has gotten a lot better over the past really couple of years. Uh, involved, uh, and this has been posture tracking. So this means you take some video of an animal and then you track it, whether it's using deep lab cut, measuring this paw, or sorry, sorry, Mackenzie's hand of a mouse, and, uh, or whether you're looking at uh, walking or the mouse walking or looking at for more detailed kinematics or trying to keep the identities of a bunch of fish moving around together as they swim. Like this is something we've gotten the deep learning methods and other things have gotten really good at over the past few years. But what I'm interested in aren't necessarily these quick postural movements. So it's certainly something we need to do in order to sort of ask the questions we're interested in, but really the types of behavior I'm interested in are things that are at longer length scales, right? So all of these small postural movements that we see an animal make are really kind of an expression of underlying states of, an, of the animal's 
that are sort of biasing behavior in different ways. So kind of the simplest way I always like to talk about is circadian rhythms, right? There's some underlying state, which is going to bias you towards more active or more sleep-like behavior, depending on how, what this internal clock is doing. There's things like eating, like your various, your underlying state of hunger is going to bias the probability that you're gonna do something related to either searching for or consuming food or more complicated dynamics such as parenting, or finding a partner or aging. And these are all internal states that bias behavior output. And really these are things that are happening across many different length scales, some of which are sort of emergent phenomena and some of them are explicitly put in, right? There's an explicit system biologically, which is setting us up for 24 hour cycles. And this has been a result of evolution, but there's some other things which might be more emergent. And so trying to understand how do you create models of behavior that can gain insight into these multiple time scales of behavior when you're only really able to directly measure the stuff that's at the that's at the sort of this postural control level, right? I can't measure hunger. I can measure an animal's desire to get food. I can measure how quickly an animal will eat food. I can measure how the animal's behavior is changing to look for food, but I can't measure hunger. And so trying to actually get a sense for what those internal states are and how they bias behavior is important. And that on top of it affects what we're going to do with these underlying postural movements. And sort of the mathematical picture, and this is sort of this incomplete picture that I, that, but this is kind of the type of goal that we're thinking about, or at least how sort of minimally the, the idea in my head mathematically about what's going on is imagine you have some sort of behavioral landscape. Again, physicist. So you have a sort of this thing which is maybe let's say each of the troughs in this landscape is an individual kind of stereotype behavior that an animal performs. And then there's little peaks and valleys and then there's some noise. And so then you will see kind of the animal would kind of move between these different valleys and each of these different kind of troughs would be a different stereotype behavior. And that would be a way of sort of seeing what's happening as the animal is moving. However, with time, this landscape can morph through some maybe deterministic function, maybe stochastic function. And then these underlying states change or the barriers between the states change. And thus that's going to change kind of how we would expect one behavior to follow another one, to follow another one, to follow another one. And really it's kind of this dynamic kind of non-stationary picture of how behavior emerges. And that's really the sort of thing that we're trying to develop and trying to work towards in our group. But if you look at if you look at sort of what most people have done, and this isn't necessarily as a criticism, just because you have to start somewhere. But if you look to see what most studies of animal behavior and long time scale structure animal behavior look like, uh, you see that they have a very statistically stationary approach. And so uh, these these for the record are four studies I actually really like. Uh, so, for example, there's a bunch of classic work from the 70s and 80s looking at sort of different sort of transitions of grooming behavior in animals and seeing, trying to look at this from this kind of Markovian picture, meaning that the behavior that the animal does next is only a function of what the animal is doing now. And trying to actually basically, so you're, you're marginalizing over all of the past of the animal and you're basically saying, what's the next thing the animal is doing? Or there's other types of structure where you can get a little bit more complicated, where for example, you do what's called an autoregressive hidden Markov model, where you have some maybe slight non-stationarity, where you have these stereotype behaviors which have maybe hundreds of millisecond time scale that are switching between, but yet still on the time scale of a second, or at least a few seconds, you still have this roughly statistically stationary picture of behavior. And moreover, you could even do this thinking about notions where you were trying to do sensory motor integration for the animal, trying to decide what's going to do next. Even then, basically all of these studies assume some sort of picture where the overall statistics aren't changing on a time scale, which is much longer than a couple of seconds. Whereas we know things like circadian rhythms, other things are much longer time scales. Hunger is a much longer time scale. Aging is clearly a much longer time scale. So trying to actually incorporate those things is gonna require a different type of way of looking at the system. And people have actually thought about this. Uh, and even before kind of our modern era of machine learning, there's some, there's some really fantastic work. Actually, uh, 
So this, this is a beautiful paper. Uh, if anybody hasn't read this, I recommend you take a look at this uh, by Walter Heligenberg uh, from 1973, where he very sort of carefully characterized the, beha the behavior of these cichlid fish as they're going around this arena. And then he fits actually this very, this very nice, or you would sort of uh, reduce dimensionality dynamics model to see sort of how are these long time scale features and behavior biasing behavior? This is the sort of analysis that I think you would probably find naturally in the pages of nature neuroscience today, um, with the exception that there's only behavior, but that's another story. Um, so, so the notion is that the, the, this is something that the, the ethology crowd has thought about for a long time, but what's been limiting is our ability to measure and quantify behavior in this detailed manner without having to manually look at a bunch of videos or because you have to also, sort of, you're not listening to the data as to what exactly are that, are the types of behavioral structures you wanna measure. And going even further back to Tinbergen, sort of this really seminal book from 1951, the study of instinct, sort of this notion that you can have different behaviors, this hierarchical structure to behavior where the same behavior can have this context dependence. I, I could be picking up a brick, say, because I want, I'm angry and I want to throw it at somebody. I could be picking up the brick because I want to build a house. I could be picking up a brick because I'm trying to give a gift here, honey. I'd like to give you this brick as a part of a mating procedure or to care for offspring. So you can have that same type of behavior mean different things or serve different purposes in different contexts. So that context dependence is also a key idea that's come through in the behavioral and ethological literature. So can we kind of try and meld these ideas in and really try and use that as a way of getting some sense of the long time scale structure and really seeing what these hidden dynamics of animal behavior are. And to that, there's really kind of three, three things we need to do. So to have this dynamical understanding of behavior, really where we're gonna pick up these long time scale structures and not rely on statistical uh, stationarity. We need to have a means of representing short time scale behavior that permits moving between time scales. So I'll get a little bit more what we mean by that in a minute, but really what I mean is you have to define, you have to have a way of quantifying behavior that doesn't explicitly put in any, uh, that doesn't explicitly kind of put in these, doesn't make this short time scale definition based on what's happening on longer time scales. We need to have something which is intrinsic to the shorter time scale that thus we can then build forward and move out, but we also have to define it in a way that doesn't depend on these other foci. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Then from these shorter time scale dynamics, we need to find a way of coarse screening out. So what's a way of taking what's happening at these shorter time scales and then coarsening it out so that we can then have a description of what are the suites of behaviors or the types of behavioral transitions we would expect to see as different time scales emerge. And then once we have these things, we need to kind of build a theoretical infrastructure to then create predictive models that sort of link this behavior in various ways. So by predicting, I mean, that's a sort of a loaded word, but I mean, three different things. One, like, can we actually predict the future state of that animal? Can we predict future experiments on different animals or even the same animal on a different day? And then can we predict things about other modalities? So can we make some predictions as to what we think the neural activity is doing or physiology or evolution? And I'll show some examples, uh, particularly on neuro neurons and evolution a little bit, but this is sort of three is really where my group is working right now and where I think some very exciting work from our group and others is sort of really trying to make some sense at the moment. But first let's start with one, okay. this notion about what are some means we can use to represent short time scale behavior that allows moving between time scales? And kind of to outline this problem, I sort of always like to show this particular metaphor. So imagine you have a room full of geneticists, right? And there's this, and you really care about this particular gene, right? What's the first thing you would measure? Right? You would measure, you would sequence it. You would measure your G's, A's, T's, and C's, or equivalently, you could look at amino acid sequences. And does this tell the whole story? Of course not, right? DNA is a molecule with complicated structure on many scales. There's methylation, there's histone marks, there's all sorts of these crazy things. But you sort of know that we have this low dimensional language that can describe the molecule. And then we can start our arguments and our more complicated discussions after that. Similarly, neurons by construction are even more complicated, but we know that by measuring things like membrane potentials or firing rates, or, or even sort of gross 
uh, quantities like the bold signal, we can then, we have this low dimensional description of what's happening in these complicated objects and really start to have our discussions about what emerges in the system. But if I show you this movie of my, of my dog and cat, what are the numbers that we can put on that interaction to really describe what's happening there? What are the things we start, what are the things we'd start with, where are the things we would go? And that's kind of sort of to set the scale for the types of problems that we need to think about. So what I'm gonna argue is a good way of at least starting and thinking a good low dimensional language to describe behavior is the notion of stereotype behaviors. So what do I mean by stereotype behavior? What I mean by that is, again, this is gonna sort of really show my physicist nature. Imagine this is the space of all possible postures an animal can make. So imagine this is like the angles of my arm or something. And so you can make some movements which are relatively simple, maybe some periodic movements or even some crazy movements or some really crazy movements. But if you watch an animal behave, you probably aren't gonna see this. What you're gonna see is something that looks a little bit more like that, right? where you see you get a bunch of behaviors which are performed often, maybe with a little bit of noise around them. And may, every once in a while, I get some weird stuff that the animal does. But for the most part, you get these kind of stereotype behaviors. That's what we'll call these kind of clusters of things, these stereotype behaviors and the postural dynamics of the animal. And the idea is we're gonna go and take these behaviors and say like, each time I go around this loop, I'm gonna go put a dot over there. Or each time I do this, I put a dot here. And then you can look at the metadynamics of how you move between these stereotype behaviors. Okay? And this notion of using stereotype behaviors, again, builds off of all of this notion, all of these notions from the ethology, ethological work of the 50s, 60s, 70s, noting that animals behavior repertoire tends to be a lot more low dimension than what you would than what's what they're cap potentially capable of and so we're going to try and use that as a way to just to create a low dimensional language to describe the state of possible things that animals are doing so all right i've been yakking around enough let's actually start looking at, at some data and so what we originally developed a bunch of these things for are and the hero of most of the talk today will be these little guys, the Drosophila melanogaster, running around and this featureless hell. Uh, basically, there's just a dish, they're running around, there's a camera following them everywhere. And we film a bunch of these guys. So in this case, there are roughly 60 male flies, each imaged for an hour. And so that's about 21 million frames of data. So I mean, what I generally don't talk about in these talks is the fact that like this start, there's some more recent data sets that I'll show a little bit that have about a billion frames of data and what sort of takes up a lot of my group's time, sort of our, our group's version of pipetting is just like figuring out how to actually deal with these big data sets, get them in RAM, out of RAM, compute stuff, get algorithms to scale. But we don't really talk about those in big talk, but just know that's sort of some of the challenges that I'm not gonna be talking about today, but that one needs to solve when thinking about this. So we have all these images, and this is kind of old work at this point, so I don't want to belabor it too much. This is back from 2014, and there's some code available, but the idea is what we're going to try and do is build a low dimensional representation of these, of what the animal is doing in these images. So we take the image, we align them so that we have translational and rotational invariance. So if the animal is doing this over here, it's the same thing as if it's doing that over there. Then we essentially track the animals in their egocentric frame to get time series. And you can imagine these time series might be joint angles or something along those lines. We then pretend like we're doing a bird song analysis and look at the spectral properties of what's going on. And in particular, we use wavelet transforms, which is a way of doing this in a scale-free manner. So we can look across a bunch of different time scales when we're defining this. And specific here, we're looking for the flies between about 50 Hertz and one hertz, so it's a pretty reasonable range of frequencies. And then we're gonna embed those points such that two points in the space are gonna be nearby. If the, uh, if, the, uh, if the animal is moving similar parts of its body at similar speeds. So if it's moving this over here and another animal is moving kind of this over here, it's, those would be two points which are close together in the space. For the aficionados, we use T-SNE for the maps I'll show today. We've also used other things and other dimensionality reduction methods. Uh, and it doesn't really depend too much about that. Turns out that this step is actually winds up being the important thing that actually sets most of the dynamics and most of the structure that we see. And I'm happy to answer some more questions about the technical details about that later. But if we then actually perform this analysis, 
we take all of those points. So each point on this plot is one point in time. And again, the points here are nearby if the animal is moving similar parts of its body at similar speeds. And we can see we get this type of space. And there's a couple of nice observations. One is that we see it's clumpy, right? It's, it's not kind of uniformly spread out everywhere. Uh, and so there's a, and we can see that a little bit better if we convolve each of those points with a small Gaussian and we see a bunch of kind of peaks and valleys uh, as it moves between. The second thing is these are points, these points are each represent one point in time. So we can watch to see how the animal is sort of zooming around through this space. And if we do that, we can then histogram the speeds in this, not the speed of the fly in the dish, but the speed of the fly in this weird abstracted space. And we can see we get this sort of sit, switch, sit, switch dynamic where it'll sort of stay, stick around for one place and switch to another place in the space, stick around, switch. And if we histogram out the speeds, we get this beautiful sort of two log normal distribution where we get two peaks, which are about two orders of magnitude separated. So you really get, so it'll sort of sit one place for a while and move quickly, sit one place, move quickly. And so we can ask, so we have the space, the, if we have the space, let's say, let's take a bunch of random movies where it's come to rest at that point in the behavioral space. And let's see what's happening. So we take these movies, turns out there, the flies are all running, happens to be at the same speed. All right, cool, let's pick a different point. Let's pick that point up there. And the flies are all grooming their head with a slight left asymmetry if you look really carefully. Or down here, the flies are grooming their left wing. So we call this our behavioral space. So with the idea that each one of these individual peaks represents a different stereotype behavior, and then we can use this as kind of an underlying structure to then try and do these later analyses and these things that we're interested in. And because one of my lab specialties is making gratuitous movies, here's a gratuitous movie. So here is the fly and the dish. Uh, position in the dish, the fly, and then the fly's position in behavioral space. And this is going to turn cyan whenever it's come in that sort of that left resting distribution. And you can sort of see that it's moving quickly through the space. And then it now this slowed down a little bit. And you can kind of see that uh, you can kind of get the structure of how it can transition the space, even though the fly is not moving. And, and alternatively, even though if the fly can be moving quickly, it still might be stationary within the space if it's performing more or less the same behavior. So that's the picture. And so that's kind of the structure. And we've done a bunch of things with this by this point. I'm not gonna go through all of them today because we don't have time, but we can look at say circadian rhythms, fly getting up in the morning, fly going to bed, or we can look at flies over the course of their whole lifetime. Uh, so we find that for example, male flies have a midlife crisis and females don't. Uh, and so uh, we look at social interactions. I'll talk a little bit later about the evolution of behavior, which I think, which is a recent story that we have that's come out that I think is pretty cool. And even looking at kind of behavioral coordination. So this is actually in rats, looking to see how as like, if you're tracking detailed aspects of the head or forelimbs or the hind limbs, how do kind of the behaviors at the individual appendage level compare to the behavior of the full organism? This is work with Benzel Vesky's group. And moreover, as sort of alluded to, this is not just a fly thing. We can do similar sorts of things on rats or on prairie voles, or even on, we've been doing some work on human stroke patients recently. Look, and being able to use these types of methods to be able to generate characterizations and different types of things along these different lines, including looking at multiple time scale structure, which is actually a collaboration partially with Jakob and then with uh, Amon Salim as well at UCL. Um, so there's this wide variety of things. And I wanna show just sort of one quick example of the type of thing one can do with this type of representation, uh, just even just looking at the repertoire without looking at the temporal dynamics. And that's looking at a common feature that almost all animals have, which is a neck. Okay. You see this giraffe beetle, and then this giraffe, you can see that you have a bunch of neurons in your brain, and then you have a bunch of stuff that the body can do. And usually there's some limited information processing bandwidth in between. So what we've been doing in flies is, again, physicist, we can then sort of look at this structure, these descending neurons, which are roughly about 300 pairs 
of neurons going from the brain of the fly down to the rest of the body compared to about the 10 compared to about the tens of thousands in the brain there's only a few hundred which are going down and then we can sort of try and treat this as a way of looking through uh, this channel to right? view this almost as a channel coding problem trying to see how that information is compressed down into into commands that are then being used by the rest of the body so oh, I won't get to all kind of the cool theoretical work we've been thinking about that lately, but I want to show this example. This is some, I have some really great collaborators in Genalia that have that made driver lines. These are fly brains for those of you who aren't aficionados or not used to looking at these sorts of things. And what they're able to do is they were able to engineer particular drivers using this split GAL4 technology where you can express a redshifted channel rhodopsin only in particular sets of neurons which have cell bodies in the brain and have axons which traverse down through the ventral nerve cord. Uh, and the nice thing about flies is that their cuticle is translucent to red light. So you just shine a big red LED in the background and you have a freely behaving fly. And you can thus, no surgery, just, just very complicated genetics work. You could then go and see what are the behavioral effects of stimulating a given neuron. So given that, so here is a particular set. This is a nice clean one. So these are a few different neurons on each side. Again, fly brain, the ventral nerve cord, and you can see you have some cell bodies up here and then axons travel down through here. But what you'll have here is a bunch of trials aligned to each other uh, where this is five seconds before the light comes on. Now the light will come on at t equals zero. You can see you get this big sort of pattern up here. Then at 15 seconds, the light comes off. and everything goes back to normal. So what we do is we had to develop some reasonable statistical tools to be able to isolate. This is the region which is going off uh, on when the light's on compared to both when it's off for that animal and also in our control animals, which are the same, but don't have, which aren't fed the retinol binding factor so that the channel rhodopsin doesn't work. And we can isolate these thing, these regions up here and so we also get this one, which goes down, which is doing nothing. So the fly is not doing nothing when we stimulate this neuron. And it turns out that what's happening in here, so if you look at these flies on the left, light comes on, they're gonna groom their head uncontrollably. So we're able to isolate these things automatically from the, uh, from the videos without having to, without having to look in, uh, in advance. And then, for example, here's the full behavioral space we get. And this is, a, this is based off of almost a billion frames of data. So if this was sort of a, one of these big data type of challenges of how to actually get this all to practically work. And then each one of these sort of red translucent regions represents a different line. And so we can tile up this behavioral space and then we can use that as a way of trying to get, get some insight. And hopefully we'll have time to come back to this a little bit later to see where this might fit in with this sort of notion of context dependency and behavior. All right, so okay, so that's so. There, there's a quick question from from YouTube from Jakobs asking, "Can I comment on using TSNE versus UMAP?" The the practical difference is there's not a huge difference. Uh, UMAP is clearly easy to use, easier to use. It scales a little bit better, has some nice things. TSNE actually has the cost function, which is a better cost function for what we care about because what I said is we're looking for stereotype behaviors. And stereotype behaviors means we really just care about that local clustering structure. So if you look at the underlying um, co sort of cost function of TSNE, it's basically entirely ignoring stuff at that global scale. And it's really focusing in on that local scale. So TSNE, if it's practically possible, we find is a little bit better at pulling out the types of features and structure that we care about. That being said, it's also harder to manage and a little bit more difficult to deal with. We've come up with some strategies, but uh, it winds up often uh, being a little bit better with TSNE, but UMAP gives qualitatively similar results. So, uh, and if there's any more questions on that, happy to take those later too. All right. So, all right. So that's sort of a means of representing behavior. So now let's actually get into this sort of coarse graining and fine graining procedures to go between these different representations. And what I'll really focus on here is looking at these coarse graining procedures. So how do we go from these kind of stereotype behavior levels to figure out sort of how do repertoires of behavior emerge and how does the temporal ordering merge? 
And this again really gets to this sort of this Tinbergen and this Heiligenberg and ethology sort of ideas of how do you pull up these types of dynamical structures. So let's go back to our fly behavioral space. And what we can say is, so each one of these is a peak. So let's actually calculate what are our Markovian transition probabilities. So what so each one of these lines represents the probability of given I start in this behavior, what's the probability I transition to another behavior with the thickness of the lines is proportional to that probability. And then the curvature or the handedness of, is the direction. It's all right-handed. So this means this is this direction, this is this direction and so on. And so the idea is we have the structure on the behavioral space and can we see something about what this structure says? One thing we can just look at it immediately is it's not a hairball, right? You don't get too many things which go from here to here, or here to here, which means you're typically transitioning mainly to local near to similar behaviors. Now, I think there's a very practical reason for that. And that's that the fly doesn't want to sort of fall flat on its face. Like this is what Richard Dawkins called postural facilitation. This idea that like if you're grooming your head, you have to do some stuff in between before you start grooming your wings, otherwise you're gonna fall on your face. And so that's a lot of the reason for that. But I think there's actually some deeper and more interesting structures that we can observe there. So let's keep going. So this is one way of looking at this, these transitions, but let's go and look at the more traditional way, which is as a matrix. So here's this trend, this exact same data as before, and now just plotted in matrix form. Well, here's the initial state of the fly. Here's the final behavioral state. There's roughly a hundred states, I think 117 states here for those counting. And you can see again, there's a sort of blocky structure to a lot of these things. And this has been arranged to kind of optimize the blockiness. And so this is clearly a very non-random structure. And the question is, this is this Markovian picture of only thing that matters is my current state. And that's the thing that determines where do I go next? And so the idea is how well does that work? So let's start by asking that because if that works well, then we can just be done. So if we had a Markovian model, right, what we would say is what that means is to get the probabilities, what I would do is I would, if I wanted to see what's happening a hundred time steps from now, I would then basically multiply that matrix by itself a hundred times. And I would get this matrix here, which has a bunch of vertical lines, which means it's kind of random, right? So what that means is my, it doesn't really matter what my initial state is. My probability for going to the final state is roughly the same. So I'm basically transitioning to the mean, to whatever my, my long-term temporal average probability of giving a particular behavior is. That's what we would get if we were just to take the Markovian approximation. We can actually calculate these joint probabilities from the data. And when we do that, we get something that looks like that. So there's clearly, it's clearly sort of gotten some of that structure degraded, but we can see still the ghosts of this block diagonal structure emerge. And even at a thousand, it's looking a lot more random. And even then, even still, there's still some interesting structure that's there. We can quantify that by looking at the eigenvalues of these matrices. So uh, because of something called the Perron Frobenius theorem, you're always going to have one eigenvalue which equals to one for a transition matrix. And so we're not showing that because that's just mathematically what it has to be, because that just means you're having probabilities. And then you can look at the lower eigenvalues. And from our from our Markov model, you would get all these dashed lines here. So this would be the second eigenvalue, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. And then, but for the data, we can always see that for each of these, we're getting these very long time scale structures that emerge. And note how this, this is a log scale on this axis. So this is diverging by quite a bit from what we would expect from a Markov model. And I should note, this is not just the theoretical calculation. This is actually from shuffling the data and assuming a Markov model on that. So this is kind of a best case scenario for what the time scale would look like. And even then we're still getting the structure. And what's interesting is that this is actually a really non-generic thing. You can write down all sorts of models and it's really hard it's not hard to write down a model where the second eigenvalue does this. It winds up being really hard to write down a model where all of these eigenvalues do this, particularly in, a, um, in an emergent manner. So really what this is tells, winds up telling us is there's a bunch of these time scales which are kind of put in by hand by the animal, which maybe shouldn't surprise us. I mean, there's things like circadian rhythms and hunger which have these definitive time scales which, are, which occur. And those are set by things that are not just the animal's behavior. There's certainly some feedback involved to that, but there are actually some underlying structures that are there. 
And turns out though, this is not, this is a very, although it's not a generic feature of models, it's a very generic feature of data. So we can do the same thing with flies of different ages, both male and female flies. This is some analysis work from Catherine Overman, who is a grad student in my group, uh, based on some data that I helped take back as postdoc. We can see this looking at social bonding and prairie voles. We see the same types of long time scale structures. This is work from Senna Geza, who's a grad student in the group. Uh, and then uh, also we even, even just looking at brain data, this is looking at uh, trans looking at human ECOG uh, data from epilepsy patients at the Emory Epilepsy Clinic. And we can even from that, we can see that these long time scales emerge here by almost four orders of magnitude difference. So there's, this is something we see a lot in behavioral and neural data. And what we're then trying to figure out is what, what are sort of some ways that we could try and pull out what the structure might be. So what parts of this best behavioral, this behavioral space best predict long time scale dynamics? And what we did from that is we, we used a compression based approach. So the idea is we're gonna try and cluster this behavioral space. Again, we're gonna coarse grain it. We're gonna take these hundred odd behaviors and reduce it to some smaller number by grouping them together. But we're gonna do it in a special way. What we're gonna say is we're gonna optimally predict the future state of the, what the fly is doing using as simple of a representation as we can. And so in other words, we're, and we're taking this calculus of variations approach, which is called information bottleneck, uh, which from Natalie Tishby and others, uh, from 1999. And so what essentially you're doing is you're taking what's the mutual information. So kind of what this gross nonlinear correlation between sort of this coarse grain state of the animal and the actual state of the animal sometime tau in the future. But we're gonna also say, we wanna make this as simple as possible. So we wanna ma basically make our compression, uh, we wanna compress away as much of our detail as possible. Or in other words, we wanna put it in as few number of clusters and we can handle this trade off through this temperature or this inverse temperature beta parameter. We can vary beta, tau, the sort of how far in the future and the number of clusters. And if we actually perform this optimization, what we see is, so here is the simplicity on the x-axis and here is the predictability on the y-axis. So you sort of want to be up here, right? You, this is simple, so you want to be the left and this is being able to predict stuff. So you want to be high. So the further back up here, the better you are. And each of these things represents a different time where this is sooner and later. Comfortingly, the curves go down with time. So the further out I'm looking, the less I can predict. We might start to get a little bit worried if I'm looking further and further into the future and I could predict better. So these curves are going down, but they don't actually go to zero. Even at a thousand times or a couple of time, thousand time steps in the future, you can still see there's some, there's some amount of information which is still there. And what we can do is let's go along one of these lines. So this is tau equals 100. So one of those examples I showed you earlier. And let's actually look as we move from more, to sort of from simpler representations to more complex representations, what do those look like? So again, moving up along this line, what you can see is as you allow more and more clusters, you get this hierarchical breakdown of the space. So obviously one cluster is just everything, two is idle and everything else. Then you get locomotion splits off from that. And then from that, you get anterior, posterior, and so on. And you get more and more complex things that emerge. And so that's kind of the idea is that you wind up getting this hierarchical structure of behavior. And this agrees a lot with exactly what Tinberg and other people had seen previously that this notion of hierarchy emerging naturally from these structures and data, from these behavioral transitions to explain what's happening at these longer time scales can give uh, some insight. And this is just a different way and probably perhaps a prettier way of seeing what's happening as you go from one cluster out to 20-ish clusters, you can really see that sort of, that you get this hierarchical breakdown more or less it's happening until you get to sort of a little bit further on and then the noise winds up taking over and you can't really represent stuff quite as well. And the other no point to note is you get the same sort of hierarchy. This is looking along different representations at the same time. You could also look at representations at different times. And you can also see moving forward in time, so predicting further and further out into the future gives you the same sort of breakdown. So nearby, you can have a more complex representation as you go in, looking further and further into the future. Maybe if you're looking at an hour into the future, maybe just awake sleep is the only thing you've got. And so that was sort of sort of representations and allow you to do this type of coarse graining notion. <clears throat> 
And just to quickly sort of connect up to where this, to the neuroscience, if we go back to these descending neurons, what we can then ask is this is predicting a context dependence. So different actions are gonna have different types of behavioral effects depending on the, uh, depending on what are these long time scale behavioral states we're seeing. And sure enough, we get context dependence in the, nerve, in the nervous system as well when we're looking at these uh, descending neurons. So for example, here is a pair of neurons and you can ask, all right, there's two different actually regions in that space that light up. When the uh, when the when we turn the red light on, this big this big yellow one over here and this small white one, and we can ask, what's the conditional probability of where was the fly doing right before we turned on the neuron when it went here, and what was the fly doing right before when it went here? And so we can see these are, and that's what's represented in these density plots. So you can see that we get very different results, right? So up here we can see that this uh, that the fly winds up doing sort of a wide swath of things. And this is kind of doing small little leg movements. Whereas here, basically more or less, if you're doing this guy here, you're gonna go there. And I should also note, we can quantify this. There's about half a bit of information and considering that the maximum possible is one bit of information, we actually are getting a fair amount of information about what's going on. We can see what this behavior is here. And this is like this sort of wing flicking out behavior. And so it's probably a courtship dependent type motion. And so if you're doing something with your wings or if we're in this courtship context, we can then uh, see that stimulating the same set of neurons winds up resulting in different types of behaviors. And so we are seeing some signatures of this context dependency. And then each one of these points in this plot is a different neuron. And essentially, if you're above this line and below this line, it's showing that you have some evidence of context dependency and this neural firing. And it turns out like almost 85% of our lines are showing some degree of that. And so we really are understanding the sort of structure of this context dependency. And hopefully that's, and that's kind of definitely one sort of notion that we're exploring in a bit. So I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes at the very end talking about kind of some notions about theoretical infrastructure to create these predictive models. Um, I'm running a bit short in time, so I'm gonna give kind of the quick version of this, but just as one example of the type of thing we can do. So this was some data and this is a recent preprint that we have out and hopefully we're submitting a revision of this in the next couple of weeks. Uh, this is some great work by Damian uh, Hernandez and Catalina Rivera in my group. Well, so those are uh, both in Ilya Nemanman's group collaborating with me, I should say. And what we're doing essentially is looking at behavioral space from about from six different species of flies uh, at about 600 flies in total. And basically trying to see, can we infer anything about the evolution of the animals by looking just at the extent behavioral representations? So here's what the mean behavioral spaces look like for the six species. They're quite different. In fact, if we then were to do a low dimensional representation of their behaviors, we can then see that there's a bunch of interesting structure where here they're colored by the species of the fly. We can see their structure there. And if we even just do a logistic regression on the behavior repertoire, we can then predict what the what the which species it is with over ninety percent accuracy on average. So there's really sort of nice species specific character information in these behavior representations. And then what we did is we can create. We and I'm just going to walk through this quickly, but then the main notion is we can then do a Bayesian inference problem trying to infer or do ancestral reconstruction on the space. And the end output is we have kind of two covariance matrix that we need to do this inference. One which is related to the individual covariance and one to the phylogenetic. So the individual covariance is what's the covariance matrix you're going to see about individuals within a given species. And if we measure that matrix, we get this nice blocky structure, just like we saw in that transition matrix. Uh, and then this is what those blocks look like in terms of the behaviors. And if we then do that same information bottleneck calculation, we get almost the exact same thing out. And so how we interpret this, and this is the point I'll more or less end on, because I'm definitely running out of time, is that the idea is we get this interpretation that the, 
that we get an equivalence between these coarse grain behavioral states that the animal's in. So these information bottleneck sort of clustery states that we got from prediction of the future and that sort of the mood of the animal and then sort of this variability. And so the notion is that a lot of the variability that we attribute to in behavioral experiments is actually often due, not due to the types, the sorts of kind of random variability or individual variability we often chalk it up to, but it's really due to a lot of variability in terms of measuring the initial condition of the system, which in some ways is relating to some of the nice work that people have done in machine learning, looking at needing kind of uh, sequential autoencoders to try and get a notion of like what the initial state of the system is, say for a motor control problem. So we see the same sort of thing, even when we're looking at these full behavior repertoires. And what this allows us to do then, in the case of evolution, is then we can then focus on, this is the stuff which is not related to the mood. And then we can get these sort of coarse grain traits, which we can then, which will then sort of in future work, try and then correlate in with kind of genes that might be evolving and affecting behavior. And with that, so with that, I will sort of skip the end, but just I'll point out again that at the end, one of our goal, our main goal here is to try and build these types of infrastructure, build these types of representation and course grading procedures to then be able to build up this infrastructure and to really try and think about what are ways of building predictive models based on these complicated measurements. And this is something obviously we're working on and I'm, just to be completely shameless, I'm currently recruiting grad students and postdocs. So if you're interested, please contact me one of these places. And I really like to thank our group members who are doing all the work, a bunch of lab alumni and the fantastic group of collaborators, Jakob included, and of course the people that give us money. So thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Um, we can now, um, now is a good time to ask questions. You can either post the questions in the chat and I will read them off. I'm not, yeah, let, let's do that. I'm not sure that sort of giving over the microphone and unmuting people is a, is a practical thing that will probably go wrong. And um, we've got one question from the chat that was asked towards the last uh, minutes of your talk and that was from Elmira and she asks, how can we understand in what sequence or pattern we should make the clustering more complicated? Um, to, for context, this was asked when you showed the coarse graining for the, from the information bottleneck method. Yeah, so I think that's, that's a great question. And so the notion of this analysis that we did was that we didn't want to make the assumption. Oops. Right. So the idea here is that I think the question is we didn't know. And so the idea was let's actually look at all possible different types of clustering we could have chosen, which would make sense. For example, we can see like if we get a curve that looks like this, then honestly, like doing these more complicated clusterings probably didn't make much sense because we're just as predictive as if we were back here. And so to that extent, that's one way of saying what's the most complicated clustering that we could sort of, that would make sense given our data. But the notion is like for these curves up here, right? There's a bunch of different clusterings that could make sense depending on what time scales we're looking at. And so how I view a lot of the sort of clustering and coarse graining procedure is really it's it's a coarse graining operation. It's I care about different time scales, and so at different time scales, those different coarse grainings make more sense or less sense. And that's kind of how we how we've been thinking about it at any rate. Great. I also have a question from my side. Um, and maybe if, if you go back two slides, I think it was, you showed these eigen, uh, the decay of the different eigenvectors. Um, uh -huh. I was wondering whether there's a way to directly visualize what the corresponding eigenvectors are. So is there a way to map the eigenvectors of the transition matrix back into a behaviorally interpretable space? You can, it's a, it gets, I mean, it gets a little bit complicated because these eigenvectors are potentially complex. In fact, they're almost inevitably complex. And so, I mean, you can, and we've we've done this, you can sort of see how the poor Catherine uh, Overman, who's a grad student in my group, has spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to do this particular visualization. It's nothing super satisfying looking at the data. I mean, obviously for the Markov model, right, those eigenvectors won't change, right? Those eigenvectors will be constant. For the data, the eigenvectors are definitely rotating in weird ways. And, 
it's not in any way that's obviously interpretable. And really that's just because a linear method is not the right method with which to describe the system. So this is, I view this plot not necessarily as something that we can use to gain a lot of insight into what those coarse grained behaviors are, but in a way of telling us if we have a model, does that mo if the model doesn't capture this, then our model hasn't captured the important thing that we care about. So that, that's really how I would view this. But you know, I mean, certainly we spent a lot of time doing that, but I think at the end of the day, it wasn't a super easy thing to interpret. Great, thank you. Uh, there's another question from um, that, that Silke uh, transferred into the chat that was also asked on YouTube. Um, I'll, I'll just read it out. Um, and the, the question is, I like the idea of a hierarchical model to capture slow variation. In part two, it seemed like you did this by continuously varying temperature. What about instead explicitly building a multi-layer Markov model with upper layers representing time of day or stage of life? So we've we've thought a bit about this. So like looking at, say, for example, hierarchical hidden Markov models or, or things along those lines. Um, the problem is that just required a lot. What we were trying to avoid is too much overall fine tuning. So this is certainly something we played around with a bit. But one of the things I didn't, oh, maybe I'll go to this now because I'm prompted. So one of the things we've been thinking about more instead, and this is some work that we're at the moment, but I think is pretty exciting. Um, so this is some work from Itai Pikovyevsky, a former postdoc in the group and now been taken over by Catherine, it has been to you sort of over-parameterize the problem using recurrent neural networks. So instead of creating a hierarchical structure to, to describe the behavior, have a over-parameterized dynamical structure, and then use that, study the kind of the, the topological properties of that, of that dynamical system, to then see how these long time scales emerge. And long story short, what we can actually see is we can, we can take these data of find fixed points and actually it ties very nicely to a Langevin picture on the space where you have modulating uh, energy barriers between the between the troughs. So that's that's a story we're writing up right now. So stay tuned. Great. Cool. Um, and there's another question from um, from YouTube. Um, I, a technical question. I'll, I'll also read it out. Um, and it refers to uh, the application of TSNI. And it, it's asking whether um, the interpretation of TSNI is not complicated by the fact that the density of points in TSNI is typically not uniform. I mean, so, well, so I think that the, right. So that's a very good point. So the, the notion is that you have, TSNI is not a metric space. Like, so the, the distance is there, you can't take super literally, especially like if you're gonna compare this distance to this distance, maybe this distance to this distance makes sense, or sort of this triangle is a reasonable sort of metric triangle, but this one certainly is not. And so how does that complicate the velocity measurements? I would mean, so if this were like a factor of two, then that would be a, a, re, a quite reasonable uh, worry to have. But given this is two orders of magnitude, it really is, it's staying put or it's moving. And you can kind of see that. So let's go to the movie over here. So if you look at the movie, so just pay attention over on this side, you can really see it like zips around, then it stays put. So it's sort of, and really what that's doing is in between, so my interpretation is that what the points are doing in between are the non-stereotyped movements that an animal makes. And though one, I think the important notions of Sort of what we chose to do here compared to some other approaches is that not every point in time is a thing, so to speak, right? So you're not assigning every single point in time to a stereotype behavior. And the idea is you can take these sort of big sort of zips through the space and say, you know what, we're not gonna call that anything that we necessarily know what it is. And we're only gonna take the places where it sort of stays put. So if it stays put, then we sort of know that. Um, and again, because we get that separation of a couple orders of magnitude, we can make a reasonable definition of stays put or not stays put. We have to be a little bit careful. We do sort of like a canny edge detection type of two threshold method to make our decisions, but that's a, a more technical point. Great. Thanks. Um, and there's another question um, from Aaron in Asia. It's asking, what does it mean that the eigenvalues are getting smaller over time? <laughs> 
It means that you, I mean, it, it basically means that you can predict less to a certain extent. So uh, it means that the, or I mean, technically what that really means is that your initial, your, your information about the initial condition fades. So one way of interpreting these, uh, these quantities over here, these eigenvalues is that given my state of the system at this point, how well could I reconstruct where the system was when I started? Right? So really what this is saying is how much information do I have in a linear model about where the system was at the beginning? And, and so one would expect that those, eigenvalue, those eigenvalues should be getting smaller because I, should, I shouldn't be able to predict more as I move to the future unless I had some very weird kind of very specific periodic driver where say I have like some sine wave where all of a sudden at the crest of the sine wave, I'm able to predict more. Uh, but unless you have some structure like that, you should almost always just, you should be going down in time. And because we're, these are all plots that are averaged across 59 flies, one would expect that we'd be very surprised to see anything rise. You can get them rise at the end, but that's just due to statistical noise and the fact that these don't have a central limit theorem. Cool. Great. Um, and there's a question from Jane Deng, who's asking you to elaborate on the nonlinear transformation on page 20. So she must have page been page 20 when you moved from one slide to another one. Oh, oh this one is, I assume on, on this slide? I mean, they're all nonlinear transformations to a certain extent. It's, it's this um, slide, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, uh, I mean, so if you mean the dimensionality reduction, um, the dimensionality reduction, so, there's a few different nonlinearities. Well, this is more or less linear because just a rotation and translation. This one is just tracking, which is also a nonlinear transformation, but we'll assume that's not it. Here is a linear transformation because it's, it's initially a linear transformation because a wavelet's invertible, but we make it a nonlinear transformation because we're only looking at the amplitude of that. So that's one, that's one, and that's actually our most important choice of nonlinear transformation here because of the fact that the um, that allows us to avoid questions like phasing between behavior. So if you have two things which are slightly off shifted, you can then call it the same thing. Again, there's a bunch of value judgments. One of the things that I always rail against is when I'm reviewing papers is people calling methods unbiased behavioral analysis. All of these things are biased, right? There's like, I try and be a good Bayesian and say like, there's there's no such thing as an unbiased method. This is just, you can just make your choices explicit or you can make your choices implicit. We just try to, we just choose to make our choices explicit when you're using an unsupervised approach rather than a supervised approach. Um, and so we made this specific approach of this nonlinear embedding because we were trying to find kind of clustery structure in this high dimensional space of wavelet amplitudes. And, and from that, we needed to really isolate this localized structure. And so particularly at the time, t -SNE was the best thing for that. And I still claim that it basically is, I mean, or some of its kind of neural network uh, offshoots are kind of the best way of really trying to isolate what's this low dimensional clustery structure. But t -SNE also has these complicated computational properties which make life difficult. And so sometimes we've used UMAP. I have the plots. I can show you the plot for if you use UMAP for this. It's basically the same, it just the, the main difference is that sort of this idle peak sort of gets pulled away from everything else because it's trying to preserve that global structure and the sort of the locomotion gets compressed a little bit. But overall, it's essentially the same. Great. Um, we're almost at the end of our question time or total time we have. Um, I wanted to ask you one kind of more high level question on, I mean, most of the results you've shown us were from, from flies in a dish, which is not really the environment that, that sort of brings out the best in their behavior. So I, want, I wanted to ask you what your plans or current work is on, on really trying to study these things in, in more naturalistic uh, um, situations where there's social interactions and, and where there's more more happening or whether it's more natural behavior happening? Well, yeah, no, I mean, so certainly there's, there's a few different, uh, there's a few different projects we're doing, including one with Jakob. So, uh, but the, but so one of the projects that we've been really sort of having a lot of fun with have been, uh, have been like these prairie voles. So if you notice there's, the, in this particular case, there's a, there's another vole underneath this cup here. And then we're tracking this vole. These are cool animals because they're one of the few rodent species that form monogamous social bonds and they do have biparental care and interesting things like this. And so we've been studying, and this is a collaboration with Robert Liu and Larry Young, also at Emory, um, trying to really see what's happening neurophysiologically and behaviorally over the course of these bonds forming. 
So this has been one really cool project trying to see if we have this very ethologically important behavior with other animals around and can we actually see the structure and also doing it while we're uh, recording out of a couple of different brain regions. Um, there's another set of projects looking at, uh, so this is uh, in rats and this is sort of related to this video up here taken in Amon Salim's group. And this is really trying to look to see how, how rats sort of adapt to various different things in their environment changing and seeing what's happening to the neural, how different parts of the nervous system are biasing the performance of behavior as their environment changes and moves around. So we're thinking about a lot of these different things, but again, why we started buying these sort of existentialist hell things to begin with is mainly just because the image processing wasn't possible until really a couple of years ago. And that's really been, or it was possible, but it just took a way more work than was than uh, before we could actually get to the interesting stuff. But now that sort of some of the, all of these deep learning things from deep lab cut and leap and other types of things have emerged and we've had to kind of add some layers on top of that to actually get them to work for these really long behavioral experiments. Uh, that's really been allowing us to kind of look in these more complicated environments and other types of situations. Great. And we have one uh, one mm -hmm. question, and that, that would be the final question for today okay. um, from Elmira, uh, who's asking will whether switching between coarse grain and fine grain with a specific pattern will help us in behavioral predictions, especially in longer times? I mean, to a certain extent, I mean, it should. Um, I mean, for example, if we look at, uh, let's move forward. So if we, I mean, if we can go back to our, to our structure here, right? So if we're looking at longer times, what this is saying is that we have a coarse grain if I'm trying to predict something which is happening at short time scales, right? Most of my behavioral transitions are nearby. So I want a fine grain representation, right? So I really do care about the things that I'm going nearby. But if I wanted to predict something an hour from now, I sort of, the best I can do is basically say, which of these two clusters am I going to be in, right? There's not, there's less than a bit of information once you get that far out. Now, you can you can you could win if if you were to bet on this multiple times you would win a little bit of money because there's some information but the best you can probably do is get about a one bit of information about what you're doing at these different scales and so moving further out into the future you need to use that coarse grain representation what i would argue is what we probably need to do is think about this as a more smooth moving through where there's a bunch of underlying processes those processes have different autocorrelation times and that those autocorrelation times will sort of all go to zero at different kind of levels. And so really what we're trying to do is isolate what are those different types of processes. And that's really been one of the cool work that Kanish Jain, who's been, who's a grad student in my group has been playing around with using recurrent neural networks for such things. And hopefully again, that's a paper we're working on and hopefully we'll be able to share that with within the next couple of months. Great. Thank you very much, Gordon, for this uh, fascinating and interesting talk. I was a little bit disappointed about the, the lack of participation of your cat, but I assume oh, I'm she's, sorry. Just I, a, I, yeah, yeah. she's just he's, an he's idle cluster somewhere. for the moment, and she's probably happy that the, the, the Zoom talk is over. <laughs> thank you very much, Gordon. Well, thank you for the invitation. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, so thank you, everyone. Paul. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Jakob. Thanks to all the viewers and the listeners. And if you want, you will see us again in two weeks' time, same time, same place. Uh, with the next talk in our neural colloquium, the Hertie lecture with Gustavo Deco from Barcelona. So everyone is invited to join us again. So have a nice evening, everybody. Have a nice day, Gordon. Bye-bye. <laughs>